L'Université McGill est ravie de célébrer les réalisations de l'un de ses diplômés, l'honorable Kenneth Wayne Dryden. I ask Professor Robert Lecky, Dean of the Faculty of Law, to present our distinguished alumnus so that he may have conferred upon him the highest recognition that it is within the power of this university to grant. And I ask Mr. Dryden to join me at center stage for the presentation of the honorary degree. Dean Leckie. Mr. Chancellor, author, lawyer, politician, academic, sports executive, member of the Hockey Hall of Fame and philanthropist, Honorable Kenneth Wayne Dryden is a Canadian Renaissance man. The beloved goaltender of the Montreal Canadiens helped the team win six Stanley Cups. He was awarded five as in a... He was awarded five Vezina trophies as the league's outstanding goaltender, the Calder Memorial Trophy as Rookie of the Year, and the Conn Smythe Trophy as the most valuable player during the playoffs. Regarded as the most consistent goalie of modern times, his celebrity only grew as he was one of two goaltenders in the epic, unforgettable 1972 Summit Series against the Soviet Union, which captured all Canadians' imaginations. Simultaneously striving for academic excellence, Mr. Dryden earned a law degree from McGill University. Off the ice, his contributions to hockey extend to roles as team president, commentator, analyst, and best-selling best author. The game, nominated for a Governor General's Award, is regarded as the best ever hockey book. Game Change, published in 2017, focuses on the devastating effects of athletes' brain injuries. Après avoir accroché ses jambières, Ken Dryden a connu une brillante carrière au service de l'État, d'abord à titre de premier commissaire de la jeunesse de l'Ontario, puis de député libéral de la circonscription de York Centre, ainsi que ministre du Développement social du Canada, promoteur de l'éducation et de l'alphabétisation chez les jeunes, Mr. Dryden est le fondateur et principal donateur d'un programme de bourse d'études postsecondaires qui, depuis 25 ans, permet chaque année à huit jeunes vivant en foyer d'accueil d'avoir un meilleur accès à un enseignement supérieur. He has recently taught at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. His course, Thinking the Future to Make the Future, challenged his students to imagine the Canada and world they wanted to live in and how to achieve them. Among numerous other honors, Ken Dryden was named in 2013 an Officer of the Order of Canada. And we are pleased to present him with another honor here this afternoon for his numerous contributions to Canadian life from the ice to the public arena. Monsieur le Chancelier, je vous présente Ken Dryden et vous invite à lui décerner un doctorat S lettre honoris causa. I now invite Dr. Ken Dryden, who's just received his second degree from McGill University, to address convocation. Dr. Dryden. Chancellor Meehan, Madame la Principale et Vice-Chancelière, Monsieur le Président du Conseil des Gouverneurs, members of the platform party, proud families and guests, and a surtout, most of all, you, cher finissant de 2018, the graduating class of 2018. I am very glad to be here. I am very proud to receive this honor. 
And before I begin my remarks, I, I just have to say, as I was walking in and looking around the auditorium, the auditorium looks great. And, and all of you look great. And as I was coming over here today, I was remembering that when we had our law school graduation, it was here in Place des Arts also. And it was in June of 1973. And about two or three weeks before that, we were parading through the streets of Montreal with our second Stanley Cup. <laughs> it was It, um, it was a nice month. <laughs> I taught a course here at McGill for five years. For some of those years, together with the universities of Calgary, Saskatchewan, and Ryerson. Some of you here may have taken it. I called it making the future. I knew that all of you in your other courses were learning about the present and the past. I wanted you to think about the future. Canada's future, the world's future, and your own. I told the students, you have 60 plus years of your life ahead of you, 40 plus years of your working life. What kind of Canada, what kind of world do you want? Assume that you're not just a passenger to that world. Assume you're a driver. Where do you want to go? But don't just give me a vision. Visions are easy. Tell me at least some of the steps you'd need to take to get you there. I love teaching that course. The students struggled at times focusing on the future. They wanted to talk about what they already knew, the past and the present, because they were proud of what they had learned. When we would debate big questions, they would often say, they will do this, or they will do that, and I'd stop them. No, no, I'd say, this isn't about them. Very soon, they is going to be you. What would you do? I gave them several articles to read and two books, one of them by another McGill grad, Steven Pinker. It's called The Better Angels of Our Nature. It's about violence throughout history how it has gotten worse and worse, of course, except, as Steven P Pinker documents carefully and clearly, it hasn't. That no matter what we see and know, the wars, the bombings, the mass shootings, violence, in fact, has decreased through history. Because of systems of governance we've created, because of laws, because of trade and travel and better understandings, even though our capacity to commit violence with nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction have gone up and up. I assigned the book to the students not so they would learn more about violence, but so they would learn that in spite of what every adult voice in their lives has told them, that the world is not going to hell in a handbasket. That they have every right to believe that life can be better that they can make their own life and Canada's life and the world's life better. I used to love cautionary tales. 1984, A Brave New World, The Handmaid's Tale. How they are so haunting, so wise, so all-seeing and all-knowing. I'm much more impatient about them now. I don't need to know so much that things can get worse, and what life would be like if they do. Mostly, I get that. What I need to know is how not to get there, how to get to some other better place. I don't need more awareness of the problems, as if somehow more awareness automatically is the answer itself, because after all, if we know something, how could we not do what needs to be done? I need more awareness of the steps we need to take so that the awful doesn't happen. What do we do? The, what do we do? The steps, the concrete doable steps. I want, I need 
aspirational, not cautionary tales. Not aspirational in the sense of fantasies or motivational pep talks, but the actions that need to be taken that will get me and get us there. This is where you come in. Graduation, this time and stage in your life, is a time for aspirational tales. Don't hold back. The present and the future need you. In the last few years I gave the course, in the first class I asked the students to submit a one-pager for the next class, a story of one day in their life 10 years from now. Not five years. I knew that they would just slough that off without thinking. Five years, I don't even know what I'm doing this weekend. But 10 years was far enough ahead that they knew they had to come up with some answer. What they wrote was fascinating. Most of them said they will be married or with someone. Most of them said they will have kids. Most will be living in Canada, in big cities. But most of them also m mentioned international lives, not just through travel, but in working somewhere else. Many mentioned getting to work by bike, not cars. The most common occupation they mentioned was law, but most often it was environmental or human rights law, not big money law. Overall, most of the students, without using the words, described balanced lives. Work, family, friends, but also other activities. Beyond their work, other aspects of themselves and their world. Lives that were challenging and ambitious, but very possible. Ten years from now, most of them, most of us, will be living lives very different from what we now imagine. But what's interesting to me is that now, left to their own selves, to write their own story, this is what they wrote. And, and this is the tone in which they wrote it. Not with express optimism, they didn't use the word, but a life they can quite imagine that is good and worthy. One that they think about with unease, sure, but not fear. One that has all kinds of possibilities in it. It's important for us to see all that isn't and what should be. But it's also important for us to see what is. The bad, but also the good. If I were still teaching the course, I would assign Steven Pinker's new book, Enlightenment Now, where in the same way that he examined violence and its history, he looks at life expectancy, health, levels of education, income, not just in North America, but everywhere in the world. A hundred years ago, when we were dying at 50, it was impossible to imagine that today we'd live past 80. When I was a kid, we had to eat everything on our plates because, as our parents told us, think about all the kids starving in China. Today, look at China. So many things are impossible unless they happen, unless they exist, unless we see them in front of us. Then the impossible is possible. We have to see what is wrong, but we also have to see what is right. I stopped teaching my course in 2017 to do something similar, but outside the university in a CBC and Radio Canada series we called We Are Canada. It being 2017, Canada's 150th birthday, I knew that people would want to look back, to recognize, acknowledge, and celebrate those who have come before us and on whose shoulders we stand. But instead, I wanted us to look ahead because the best, the most respectful way to recognize and acknowledge and celebrate the past is to build on what came before. If the future doesn't work, if Canada was a failed country, it wouldn't matter much 
how great the past was. And if we really, if we wanted really to know who we were in, in, in 2017, what Canada is, and to see what we can be, I wanted us to look at what lots of young Canadians are doing in all kinds of fields, science, the arts, education, business, the community. They are the future shapers, the future definers, the future makers. To see them is to see what we have in us to be. And this, this is you. In sports, I learned at least two things. One, that no matter how good you are, you never start a season, you never start the Stanley Cup playoffs good enough to win. You have to find a way during that season, during those playoffs, to get better, to rise to the occasion, to the challenge, and whoever does so the most will win. Your parents see you now at 22 or 25, and they see all the incredible challenges of the world, and, and they fear. That's what parents do. They forget that one day you will be 30, and 35, and 45. You will learn even more than you've learned up until now. You will get smarter and better, even more than you are today. You will rise to the occasion, to the challenge of Canada and of the world. You will be ready to take on what you need to face. And two, that you can't know now that you can do all of these things, but just don't know that you can't. Get into your life. Find something you get so Find something you get so immersed in that you don't matter so much, and it does. So you think about it and worry and fear less about you. So you just do. And you may find out that you can do a lot more than you or anyone ever thought you could. At McGill, if not first, I learned this best. When I was going to law school, and in the other hours of the day, I was playing for the Canadians. I didn't have time to sit back and know that I couldn't. I just had to do. And then, who knew what might happen next? So, to all of you, good luck. I can't wait to see the future you will make. Thank you.